Welcome back from fall break. I hope you all have a, had a relaxing and, and fun time. We um, enjoyed the campus being a little quiet, and I took some folks on some tours yesterday, and the new student center, and the uh, new music hall, and you guys are just spoiled. I tell you, when I was at Liberty, I had one-story metal buildings that I lived in in my dorm, and one-story classroom buildings, and they look like warehouses, and so I'd, seeing, seeing all the new facilities makes me want to go back to college, but I think I'm a little too old for that. But today I'm honored to, to welcome Ralph Reed to Liberty University. He's the founder and chairman of the Faith and Freedom Coalition. He was former senior advisor to both the Bush and Cheney campaigns in 2000, 2004. He's chairman and CEO of Century Strategics, LLC. It's a successful public, public relations and public affairs firm based in Georgia. He and I had the um, opportunity to visit at the Republican National Co Convention in Cleveland. We and, and Dr. Ben Carson sat together and talked about the state of our nation, the state of the election in the uh, box there at the, at the convention. But he was formerly the executive director of the Christian Coalition. He was named as one of the most effective public, his organization was named as one of the most effective public policy organizations in recent history. Ralph has been at the center of public policy and at the center of influencing our leaders for, the, for Christian values for so many years. He's a lot older than he looks, I promise you. But he's a, a best-selling author, editor of five books. Please welcome to Liberty University, Ralph Reed. Thank you very, thank you very much, Terry. It's a great uh, privilege and honor to be with you and the students of Liberty University. Uh, boy, uh, me, uh, Jerry Falwell Jr., and Ben Carson in a skybox in Cleveland. If a grenade had gone off that day, it would have been a sad day um, for uh, for the movement and for those that we. And there were probably a few that wanted it to, but. Um, I am really thrilled to be here. I'm privileged and honored to be associated with Liberty University, if only for this day and on this occasion. Uh, Jerry Falwell, senior, the founder of this university, was a very dear friend of mine. He encouraged me and inspired me in my early forays in politics. Uh, he inspired me in the words of the Apostle Paul to follow me as I follow Christ. And Jerry, you know, I've been coming to Liberty since the 80s. I remember those metal barrack-looking buildings. And to see Liberty, which began as a small Baptist Bible college nestled in the Blue Ridge Mountains in rural Western Virginia, rise to the point that today it is the largest Christian university in the United States is a great blessing to all of us. You know, we go to the polls in 29 days in what is without question not only one of the most consequential elections in my or your lifetime, but really in American history. Not only is the presidency on the ballot, but as we gather here this morning, control of the U.S. Senate is too close to call. Probably six or eight U.S. Senate races within the margin of error. And because of the untimely death of our dear departed friend, Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia, we also, for the first time in a century, have an evenly divided 4-4 Supreme Court with an open seat that will be filled by the next president. So really, in 29 days, all three branches of our national government are on the ballot. And what I want to discuss with you here today is, first of all, all, our call as Christians to be effective citizens, both here on earth and in our heavenly kingdom. Secondly, to offer a biblical model of what that citizenship should look like. And thirdly, how we should think as Bible-believing Christians 
with specific reference to the 2016 elections. I believe that we as believers are in effect dual citizens. We are a citizen of the United States of America or the nation in which we live or reside. Secondly, we are citizens of the kingdom of heaven, a kingdom that is both here and now and is yet to come. We are similar in a spiritual sense to those Jews around the world who hold two passports, a passport for their nation of origin and a passport for the nation of Israel. And each of those citizenships carries with it certain duties and responsibilities that we should take very seriously. As citizens of our heavenly kingdom, we should pray, read the Bible, fellowship with other believers, worship the Lord, tithe and contribute, give to the poor, and serve others. As earthly citizens, we should pay taxes, but only what we owe. There's nothing wrong with taking legal deductions. Be informed. Be <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> You may have followed some of that in the current campaign. Be registered to vote, vote, and contact elected officials and make your views known. We should be diligent and muscular in carrying out both of those citizenships. You know, Jerry Falwell Sr. once said that the mission of his ministry was to get people born again, baptized, and registered to vote. There was a little humor in that statement, but as I'll walk through this, you, you'll see there was also a lot of good theology. And so let me take a minute this morning and walk through what I believe are the four key elements of effective Christian citizenship. First of all, we should participate. My organization, Faith and Freedom Coalition, based on census tract data, exit polling, and other available survey data, estimates that in 2012, there were 17 million professing evangelical Christians who did not vote, either because they weren't registered or because they registered and just didn't bother to show up at all. And this phenomenon is not limited only to Christians. There were, in 2012, only 57 percent of adult eligible citizens who bothered to vote. That was four years ago. The Pew Research Center estimates that there are 61 million eligible citizens in the United States who are not registered to vote. Now, as Christians, we should act differently. We should exercise our citizenship, including our right to vote, in a way that is a witness of our faith in Christ and in a way that advances righteousness and resists evil. And there's a dramatic example of this found in the book of Acts, where the Apostle Paul is basically arrested by Roman soldiers for causing a public commotion when he is preaching the gospel. And they take Paul because of this disturbance, they detain him, they take him to a prison cell, they tie him up, and they are about to flog him to find out what he's done that has caused the disturbance of the peace, and he turns around to one of the soldiers as he's about to be lashed, and he asks a very simple but profound question. He said, is it lawful for you to do this to a citizen of Rome? And the soldiers, filled with fear, immediately untie him, notify the commander that this is a Roman citizen and they basically let him go. Now, later on, his enemies and the enemies of the gospel try to have him convicted and executed in a show trial that they are going to have in Jerusalem, and Paul foils that attempt by exercising one of the most cherished and precious rights of a Roman citizen. He appealed his case all the way to Caesar. Not even we have that right. We can't appeal our case 
to the President of the United States, but a citizen of Rome who believed that their rights were being violated could say and demand, I want to appear before Caesar. Now, he did this not because he wasn't unwilling to die for the gospel. He ultimately did, as we all know. But this is important, and this is important today. Paul was unwilling to surrender his rights as an earthly citizen. Now, if he wasn't willing to surrender his rights as a citizen of Rome, we certainly shouldn't be willing to surrender ours. Like Paul, we are servants of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we are call called to use the gift of our earthly citizenship to share our faith, to advance the good, to resist evil, and to build and establish the kingdom of God. And now more than ever, as Christians, we have to use our moral imagination to fully grasp both the limits and the possibilities of politics. Politics will not usher in the kingdom of God. It cannot in any way, shape, or form impose moral sentiments upon an unregenerate heart. It cannot save the lost. But let me tell you what politics can do. It can protect the innocent. It can advance the righteous. It can establish the common good. It can protect the rights of the poor, of the alien and the sojourner. It can resist tyranny, and it can expand the boundaries of freedom and democracy. And politics also sets the tone for a culture, because the law is not just a list of rights and wrongs, it is also as former Secretary of Education Bill Bennett has so eloquently taught us, the law is a teacher. It lays down certain white chalk marks on the field of a culture, and it establishes the, accept the accepted boundaries of right and wrong and of morality and justice. You know, Martin Luther King, during the Civil Rights Movement, when people told him and lectured him to stick to preaching the gospel and get out of politics. That wasn't the job of the church. He responded, and he said, it may be true that a law cannot make a man love me, but it can stop him from lynching me, and that's pretty important. So too can the law today, and that brings us to the 2016 election. You know, there, there are some who claim that this election is just a choice between two deeply flawed individuals who represent just the lesser of two evils, and that men and women of faith and conscience really have no stake in this decision. We should either stay home or vote for somebody else. And some point, including brothers and sisters who share our faith, to a 2005 interview in which Donald Trump made demeaning comments about women as evidence that they claim confirms their argument. Now, those 11-year-old comments were offensive and inappropriate. And as the father of two daughters, including one who is with me today, touring Liberty University, I did not appreciate them. And I'm glad that Donald Trump apologized for them. I believe that we are called, as Paul said to Timothy, to treat older women as if they are our mothers and younger women as if they are our sisters in all purity. I also believe in the biblical principle that someone who is faithful in small things will be faithful in larger things, and that if someone is in unfaithful in a small thing, they will also be unfaithful in a larger task. And as Secretary of State, Donald Trump's opponent, set up a home-brewed email server, which the FBI, after an extensive investigation, has concluded involved the careless and negligent handling of classified material, and indeed the FBI concluded that Hillary Clinton's private server containing classified material was hacked by foreign intelligence services, exposing some of the most important secrets of our government 
to our worst enemies. She also deleted over 30,000 emails, including emails that dealt with official government business in clear violation of federal law. And then she lied to the American people and Congress about that. Now, I believe that if someone violates the public trust as a member of the cabinet in a subordinate position, there is no reason to believe that they'll be more faithful in the execution of the larger, the solemn, and the higher duties of the presidency. Now, given Now, given the choice, it may be tempting. I'd just be curious, how many of you are casting your first vote this year? Raise your hand. Look at that. It's probably 90 percent. My first vote was cast for Ronald Reagan in 1980. I have a friend who, looking at the choice this year, said he's going to write in Peyton Manning. But, and there's some of that, but let me tell you, I don't agree with those who sit on the sidelines or say they're going to write in Santa Claus or Peyton Manning or whatever it is, because I think, like the Apostle Paul, we cannot and we must not surrender our precious rights as voters and citizens, a right that has been purchased with the blood of patriots who gave their lives and their limbs and all they had to give us that right on every continent around the world. And for me, it is too precious a thing to waste on November 8th. I believe we should vote for a candidate who has a chance to be president. And I think retreating to the stained glass ghetto from whence we came and refusing to muddy our boots with the muck and mire of politics is simply not an option for a follower of Christ. We must put aside our my way or the highway pride. We should forsake cynicism and negativity you know, there is so much negative in politics. I believe we should focus on the true and the honorable and the right and the pure and the lovely and anything that is of excellence and worthy of praise. We should be cheerful, we should be winsome, and we should always be prepared to defend our faith unapologetically. That's the kind of witness we ought to have in the civic arena. You know, Ronald Reagan, in one of the most famous speeches he ever delivered as candidate or president, the so-called Evil Empire speech, he spoke to the National Association of Evangelicals in 1983, and he said this, and I want you to listen to these words and how relevant they are today. He said, beware of the temptation of pride of the temptation of blithely declaring yourselves to be above it all and to simply declare both sides as equally at fault and thereby remove yourself from the struggle between right and wrong and good and evil. You know, I think that same principle applies to this election. There are some who say there really is no choice. But as I will get to in just a minute, on issue after issue involving grave and intrinsic moral evils and essential moral rights, there are major differences between the two leading candidates and viable candidates, and to ignore them is an abrogation of our responsibility as followers of Christ and as moral actors in a dark and fallen world. Now, if we participate, we can make a huge difference. According to network exit polls in 2012, self-identified evangelical Christians made up 27 percent of the entire electorate. If you add to them the roughly one out of every 10 voters 
who are observant, faithful, and frequently mass-attending Roman Catholics who take their faith seriously, it's 37 percent of the electorate. It's about 60 percent of the entire Republican vote in 2012. It's the largest, the most vibrant, and the most dynamic single voting bloc in the electorate, and it's bigger than the African-American vote, Latino vote, and union vote combined. So we can make a difference, but only if we do the second thing, which is to persuade. We can't enter the civic arena armed with just a King James Bible and an appeal to biblical morality. You know, Teddy Roosevelt said that a thorough knowledge of the Bible was more important than a college education. He probably said that because he graduated from Harvard. And I think that's still true today, but the fact is that the world of the 19th century and early 20th century in which the raw material that formed the consensus of the culture, which at that time was the Bible, Shakespeare, and the Greek and Latin classics, has today given way to movies and popular music and reality television, and that's the world in which we live. So if we're going to influence the political arena, we have to speak in the language and the dialect of our listeners. You know, in that episode that I talked about earlier in the book of Acts, when Paul is arrested in Jerusalem, it's the moment that begins his journey to martyrdom. As the crowd is throwing things in the air and threatening to tear things apart, he turns to them and he says, would you please let me address the crowd? And everybody listens for a second and he hushes them, and then the Bible says that he began to speak to them in their Hebrew dialect. And that was when they fell silent and they listened. So to persuade, yes, we should know the Bible, but we should also know and understand public policy. We should make appeals based on the evidence and the conclusions of social science as to which policies work and which don't. And we should have a broad agenda that addresses issues such as taxes and the economy and income inequality, education, immigration, human trafficking, criminal justice reform, ameliorating poverty. And we should go to communities and voters who have not always felt welcome on our ranks and welcome them into our movement, women, African Americans, Latinos, other minorities, and young people. You know, honey attracts more bees than vinegar. And as the book of Proverbs says, the tongue of the wise makes knowledge acceptable and sweetness of speech increases persuasiveness. So our speech would, should be seasoned with grace and with love as if with salt. Thirdly, we should persevere. You know, bringing faith to bear to bring about Bible-based, moral-based social reform is not a sprint. It's a marathon. We're not going to, no matter what happens on November 8th, we're not going to restore America to repentance and moral renewal and to a revival of her founding principles in a single election or even a single generation. Think about the struggle for civil rights. The first slaves were brought to this continent in 1619. It wasn't until 1865, after 600,000 people had died, that those slaves were freed, and even then the promise of full citizenship was denied by what the historian C. Van Woodward called the strange career of Jim Crow and the doctrine of separate but equal. And it wasn't until the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act of 1964 and 65 that a struggle of over three centuries enjoyed the stated legislative victory. So against that backdrop, as well as similar social reform movements like temperance and suffrage, giving women the right to vote, 
We're in relative adolescence. We have a long way to go. You know, uh, Jerry, your father one time told me something I never forgot. He said, the thing about Christians is when they lose, they quit. And when they win, they quit. They just tend to give up. We serve the master and creator of the universe. We should have faith and keep fighting no matter what the current events are or the headlines in the newspaper or online. And finally, we must pray. Really, most importantly, we must pray. The Bible commands us in the second letter of Timothy that prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for, quote, kings and for all those who are in authority. And this is important, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. So the peace of the faith community was directly related to obedience to command, the command to pray for political leaders. And by the way, Paul wrote this to Timothy at a time when the bloody and venal Nero was the emperor of Rome. So this had nothing to do with the morality of the government or of its leader. And that means everyone, Republicans and Democrats, liberals and conservatives. Now let me close with a final word about 2016. I believe that on the issues that matter most to the Christian community, the differences could not be more stark or dramatic, nor could our responsibility be more clear. On the sanctity of innocent, unborn life, which I believe is the defining moral issue of our time. Donald Trump has pledged to protect life from conception to natural death, and he is running on the most pro-life platform in the history of the Republican Party. Hillary, <clears throat> Hillary Clinton not only defends Roe v. Wade, She's been endorsed by Planned Parenthood in her primary, the first time that organization has done so in its history. And she is the first candidate of either party in the last 40 years to shatter the bipartisan consensus and call for the repeal of the Hyde Amendment, which would allow for the first time of your and my tax dollars to be used to perform abortions under Medicaid and which the Allen Guttmacher Institute has concluded will lead to a million additional abortions. That's a million innocent human beings who will never know what it is to be held by a loving parent, to be cherished, to be nurtured, and to be welcomed into the world. In fact, in a speech last year, Hillary Clinton said at a women's summit, that it was so important to guarantee abortion on demand that, quote, deep-seated cultural codes and religious beliefs have to be changed. Now imagine that. Someone who aspires to the presidency of the United States saying that abortion is so important that people's personal religious beliefs have to be adapted to a political agenda. On the issue of religious freedom, Donald Trump supported the Supreme Court's decision in the Hobby Lobby case, giving closely held family-owned businesses the right to have those businesses reflect the conscience and the deeply held religious belief of their owners and their founders. Hillary Clinton has condemned that decision. On the issue of judges, Donald Trump has released a list of 20 conservative jurists that he's indicated would be the beginning of a list from which he would choose the replacement to Antonin Scalia. Hillary Clinton has said that she would not consider anyone for appointment to the Supreme Court who did not agree with her that Roe v. Wade is settled law and should never be revisited. And by the way, she reiterated that 
last night in the debate. Final issue, the Iran nuclear deal. A deal which not only gave $1.5 billion to the leading state sponsor of terrorism in the world, but a deal that allowed the mullahs in Tehran to retain their uranium enrichment program and to eventually obtain nuclear weapons. This is the bloodiest and most dangerous regime in the bloodiest and most dangerous region of the world. It poses an existential threat to the survival of the State of Israel. This is a regime that funds Hamas, that bankrolls Hezbollah, that props up Bashar al-Assad's regime in Syria, which has slaughtered 400,000 innocent civilians. And Hillary Clinton not only supports that agreement, she began the secret talks that led to it. Donald Trump opposes that agreement and says he will revisit it on day one of his presidency. And as somebody who supports the nation of Israel, I want a president who will revisit that agreement. I want to close today with a verse from the book of Isaiah, chapter 40. Make ready the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Let every valley be filled. Let every mountain and hill be brought low. May the crooked become straight and the rough road smooth. And may all of humanity see the salvation of God. I believe that is a call not only to our need to propagate and share the gospel, I think properly understood our citizenship is a witness of our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and is a call upon us as believers to resist evil in all its ugly forms and advance the good while we are here on earth occupying while he tarries. If Isaiah's words will become our prayer and will call us to civic action as well as action in our churches, I believe we can heal America and restore her to moral greatness. Thank you all very much. Thank you. God bless you and God bless Liberty University. David likes to do the, <clears throat> the stool, the stool question answer after. Uh, I like it too, David. Thank, you. but uh, I just uh, wanted to ask Ralph. You know, after the debate last night, I got a call from WABC in New York, and I did a long interview, and I talked about how, like what you said, I have a wife and a daughter, and there's no way to defend some of the things Donald Trump said back in 2005, and I. Um, but I said, you know what, five years from now, and we're, when we're sitting here looking at a Supreme Court, that in spite of Hillary saying she supports the Second Amendment, she'll appoint justices that will repeal it. I promise you that. And five years from now, when we're sitting here and we see all the, the Constitution being ripped apart by justices, nobody's gonna remember what horrible things D Donald Trump said over a decade ago. And I said in that, in that same interview that we're never going to have a perfect candidate until Jesus Christ reigns forever on the throne. So, <laughs> Amen to that. And, and believe it or not, the Washington Post printed that, that interview almost verbatim, and I just tweeted it out. I probably broke some rules. Are you supposed to cheat, tweet during convo or, or not? But I, I did. <laughs> so I, I, <laughs> I I'll retweet it. I tweeted the article out just now while, while you were talking, but I was paying attention. But anyway, <laughs> give me some of your thoughts about the debate last night. Well, I thought um, it was the biggest night of Donald Trump's career, political or otherwise, and uh, he had a pretty rough weekend. I did not defend those remarks. I'm glad to know that he didn't. He apologized for them. 
And I'm with you, Jerry. I, I just think, as I said in my remarks, with so many critical issues on the line, I didn't even get into the battle against ISIS or Obamacare or all the other things that were discussed last night. But I, I think that um, he won the debate. I think he apologized. He said he was embarrassed by those remarks. And then he moved on and he talked about the issues. And I, for one, think it's about time that we elevated the tone and tenor of this election. I think it should be a campaign that is worthy of the goodness of our people. And I would like to see both candidates quit pulling up, you know, tapes that were 10 years ago, 15 years, 20 years ago. I worked for George W. Bush. Uh, they dropped. You can applaud him. Uh, you know, Jerry, they, on the Thursday night before the 2000 election, they dropped a 20-year-old DWI on him and his campaign, and that's probably what led us to go to a recount and to keep going in Florida. This is their playbook. But I want a campaign about issues and not insults, and I want a campaign that focuses on the future of America, not the past of either candidate. That was the other thing I said, is that, that emphasizing issues will always trump Hillary Clinton. That's just, just my view, but, but they, don't, they don't want to talk about the, they don't want to talk about the issues, because when they do, they lose. But this is supposed to be you answering the questions, not me. But no, what, we'll just make this a joint <laughs> interview. All right, what would you say is the most pressing, pressing issue facing the nation today? I mean, you may have already answered that. Well, I talked about a number of the moral issues, so I've already addressed that. But look, I, I really believe in terms of, you know, when I talked about the need to have the broader issues agenda, you know, when Jesus went into a village, if people were hungry, they ate. Mm -hmm. If people were thirsty, they drank. If they needed what would have been the, the version of ancient and Judea and Samaria's version of health care, they got their needs, their physical needs met. If they were blind, they saw. If they were lame, they walked. If they had a need, it was met. If they had an ulcer, it was healed. And I think there are a lot of people out there struggling today. I think there are a lot of people living paycheck to paycheck. I saw a report in the Wall Street Journal that said that 60% of all the households in America do not even have $1,000 in savings. Mm. That means if they go and have a major medical bill or a car repair bill, they can't even pay it. And I think after the longest and deepest recession since the Great Depression and the weakest and most anemic economic recovery since that recession with basically one, one and a half percent growth, we need a president and leaders who are going to grow this economy, unleash the entrepreneurial energy of, the, of this country and give people jobs and an opportunity at a bright and optimistic future. I agree. In your recent book, Awakening, you say the greatest threat facing the nation is not a military opponent, but comes from within. What did you mean by that? Well, what I mean is I think it's highly unlikely that the United States, with two oceans to our east and west, and historically friendly neighbors to our north and south, we're not like Israel where we're surrounded by opponents who want to destroy us. We're not like Central or Western Europe, which spent most of the 20th century with an opponent in the Soviet Union saying they wanted to destroy their way of life. God has blessed us through our wealth, our minerals, our, our, the beauty of our country, and where we have been placed that it's going to be very difficult to invade the United States. Mm -hmm. What will happen to America, should it perish, is what happened to Rome, which is a moral and spiritual and a cultural death from within that starts at the heart and soul of a country. The thing that makes America great isn't its money or its wealth or its cities or its power. It has been its moral goodness. And if we lose that, we are lost. I agree. 
you know, you've never, you've been fearless about appearing on shows um, like with Bill Maher, and uh, you've never shied away from that. But th we've got 15,000 students here who are soon going to be going out in the world, and they're going to be defending their values against very hostile opponents. I think any advice you could give them would be, uh, would be great. Well, I, I think the most important thing is to remember that you are going to encounter opposition. Um, it will at times be very fierce. But I want you to remember two things. We serve a risen Lord, and He is right now seated at the right hand of God the Father. And He is not sitting up there wringing His hands. Mm -hmm. He's not looking down at what's happening in America or the world and going, what am I going to do? He's in charge. We're not in charge. His ways are higher than our ways. Mm -hmm. And we can, and I, Jerry, I, I mean this, I mean this sincerely. You know, I've been doing this for 35 years. This is my 10th presidential election. I started when I was six years old. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you win some and you lose some. But you know what? I've never had a time when I didn't see God's plan come to fruition, often in ways, now delayed, not the way I wanted it, but in ways that were far beyond my expectations. The second piece of advice I would give you as you get ready to go out into the world, I'm going to share a piece of advice that I was given early in my career by a consultant that was working with me. He said, Ralph, smile, you're winning. <laughs> so go out in the world and smile. You know, Bill Rusher said, Barry Goldwater and Ronald Reagan believed the same things, but Goldwater said it with a frown and Reagan said it with a smile, and it made all the difference. Yeah. You started when you were six. Is that when you voted for Ronald Reagan? <laughs> <laughs> or, or was it? Uh... No, that was 18. So it was legal I then. Would, I was working on campaigns before I could vote. So you weren't like some of these dead people that are registering to vote in Virginia? No. no? Okay. Just want to make sure. Um, as founder of the Faith and Freedom Coalition, one of your major pushes has been to get Christians registered to vote. Tell us about how you've done that with the high tech. You've told me about it before with the high technology and yep. with, the, uh, with the different lists. Just explain how that works. Yeah, at Faith and Freedom Coalition, we use the most sophisticated and advanced uh, data analytics, micro-targeting, data mining. We work with data scientists at for-profit companies as well as non-profit partners. And what we've been able to do, uh, I don't want to scare anybody here, but based on where you go online, if you go on Amazon and you buy a book and that book is a Christian book or a Bible, for example, we know that or somebody knows it. Uh, it's generally known what your purchasing habits are, where you live, what your, if you're an adult, what kind of home value you have, what kind of car you drive what television shows you watch, what radio shows you listen to. You put all this in a stew, and we track about 173 data points on every voter in the country. And if the right data points click with the right algorithm, we know with about 90% certainty that this is a evangelical Christian or a faithful Catholic. We've built a file of 33 million such voters nationwide. 15.6 million of those, Jerry, are in the top 11 states that will decide control of both the U.S. Senate and who wins the presidency. And right now, as we speak this morning, including here in Virginia, uh, we're knocking on a total of about a million doors nationwide. We're hanging door hangers like this one that simply describes where the candidates stand on the issues. Those same voters, in addition to a door knock, are getting a piece of mail. They're getting three phone calls. If they haven't voted by 3 p.m. on Election Day, they'll get another call. Uh, each one of them is getting an average of 6.8 videos contrasting the pre presidential and Senate candidates on their mobile device so that they can watch it and find out where the candidates stand. And you know, I, I hate to say this, but in case you hadn't noticed, the media is not going to give you this information. So we feel like we have to equip these believers, and with all that hard work, uh, 30 field offices and those 
top 10 states, about 2,000 volunteers knocking on doors. We're hoping, working, and praying for the biggest turnout of evangelical Christians in a presidential election in modern political history. Well, we appreciate all those efforts, and it's only eternity will tell how much impact that your organization's had on, on the future of this country and, and on the kingdom of Christ in general. And, you know, ever since I tweeted that article, my phone's been buzzing like crazy. I, I just remembered I was pretty hard on the establishment Republicans in that article, so I probably got a lot of people mad at me, but that's all right. That, um, that probably won't be a new phenomenon. No, 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 no. But, but we, uh, we're, we're, we're glad you guys are back from fall break. We appreciate you. We, we know it's a... We know it's a, uh, it, it's, it's, it's not necessarily fun to have to deal with these, with these uh, critical election issues in a very contested campaign, but we feel like it's our duty to make sure you have the tools you need to make the right decisions, and because it's your future. I'm 54, you know, before it gets really bad, I'll be, I'll be gone, <laughs> but, 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 you, but, but, but you guys have got to live with what happens in the next few elections, and so it's for your own good. And so anyway, we love you guys. Have a great day. You're God dismissed. bless you. Have a great day.